I've been reflecting this week on my friendship with Rach, and I had a very scary moment of realisation. So we met when we were 20, when I started to date Ad, and I came to Calvary for the first time, and I met this incredibly fire-anointed woman of God. And I realised that was 25 years ago. Happy 25th anniversary, Rach. <laughs> Isn't it great how God puts people in your path at different times? And sometimes you don't have things to do with them, and then suddenly God brings you back together again. And Rach and I met together again a few months ago, and it was just great to have a heart connection moment where we could talk about our kids and the challenges of being a mum and uh, just really connect with God's goodness and faithfulness on the journey of life that we have had. And so I hope you are ready for this. Get your books out. Get your phones ready to take notes. Get your hearts open because we are going to receive something great from God this morning because Rachel's has got an anointed of communication over her that we are going to be receiving today. So let's welcome her to the stage, Rachel Waddams. Woo! Wow! Big up Womborn! Womborn! Wow! It's happening in Womborn! I just want to honour a few people. Is that all right, first of all? Because um, I'm just so happy to be here. I want to honour Pastor John. He is an incredible communicator. He used to come to Calvary occasionally, I think maybe probably once a year. And he would preach the gospel often on a Sunday night was when we had the gospel. And his demonstration of how to preach the gospel was just genius. It was so good. Pastor John, thank you for your pastor, but also your evangelism. Thank you for your skill of leading many people to Jesus. And um, even this morning when he got up, I mean, how good is he? He's just amazing. So thank you, Pastor John. I have to honour my spiritual mom and dad. Every time I'm in the room and I get a mic, I have to. Pastor Paul and Pastor Gail, I wouldn't be here without them. Um, I served with them for many, many years. I was a youth pastor with them, served with them in many, many different seasons in our church. I, everything I owe to them spiritually, everything I am, probably even some of my faults, I blame on them. <laughs> yeah, they'll have to deal with it. That's what mum and dads have to do. They are incredible. Their passion for the lost is amazing. They always have a story of someone they are leading to Jesus. They are deadly. They're like the deadly 60 of evangelism. <laughs> and I want to honour beautiful Pastor Deb. I mean, how incredible is she to stand up, to be counted as a woman and say, I'm going to do this, is brave and courageous. And as I was praying for you, Deb, I really felt that you demonstrate family. And this church is full of incredible families. But God tells us he puts the solitary into families. And you're going to bring many lonely people, people who struggle with family, who've not had a good experience of family, and just through your life, just through your love, just for who this church is, you will bring about incredible breakthrough in families. Brilliant. Keep going, Deb. Anything you need, if you just want a drink, non-alcoholic, anyone who's judging, maybe not, <laughs> then I'm there for you. Don't feel alone. I know it can feel a bit lonely sometimes in leadership, but don't feel alone. I want to preach a message this morning that is so simple. That's not an indicator of anything about your intelligence in Womborn. I'm sure you are a very sophisticated group. But it was something God absolutely put on my heart a couple of months ago. And I thought, I couldn't, I couldn't leave it. And it's been sort of chasing me down. Have you ever had that sort of message? So I thought, you know what? This is, this is kind of what God has been speaking to me about and I want to preach on it today. Now, it's in a book of the Bible that those of you who are kind of really, into, you'll know, but maybe some of you might not have read it a lot, and it's Malachi. If you don't know where Malachi is, go to Matthew and flick back, and you've got a minor prophet book, Malachi. Malachi was written around the same time as Nehemiah, 
And if you know anything about Nehemiah, it was a time of desolation. The walls were down, the temple was broken. It was a really tough time in Israel. And many people were captured, taken into foreign lands. It was a difficult time. And at that time, up rose people who would deliver a message from God to remind people that they were not forgotten, to remind them to turn back to God, to remind them that this is where you're going. Often the books, the prophetic books would speak not just in that time, but times that were to come, even in the New Testament and even now. So we have the book of Malachi. Malachi means messenger. So, you know, he had a good name for what he was doing. But I'm just going to start with just reading this simple verse to you. And it says, Malachi 1, a prophecy, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? Now, when I read that, I was just absolutely blown away because I feel that that almost start of Malachi was a summary not just of that generation but I feel a summary of how often humanity is that God is saying I love you and we are saying but how have you loved us? There's a disconnection somehow between God's love and man's ability to receive that love. And I kind of want to speak about that a little bit today. Now, you may feel that you've been a Christian a long time and you know about the love of God, and absolutely you do. But do you know what? I think for all of us, we need to have that rekindling, that realigning with the fact that God's love is endless and he wants you to be reminded today how much he loves you. Psalm 103 talks about the love of God. And it says, as high as the heavens are, above the earth, so great is the love of God. Now, when David wrote that, he was inspired about the heavens. But he didn't have all of the amazing institutions we have now to understand the depths of the heaven. The moon is 855 miles away. Mars is 140 million miles away from the sun. And Neptune, the furthest planet away from the sun, is 2.7 to 2.9 billion miles away from the sun. Now, I can't get my head around that. I know if I had a billion pounds, I'd be wealthy. I get that. (laughs) But that is massive. And that's just one galaxy. So when David is saying as high as the heavens are, so great is his love, he's kind of showing us, God is demonstrating how vast his love is for humanity. It is endless. The Old Testament gives example after example of God's love. And then we have this incredible explosion of God's love in the New Testament. And John 3.16, which all of us all know, really declares what was happening. For God so loved the earth that he gave his one and only son. God so loved the earth that he gave, he was generous to us. His love is not just high and wide, but it's filled. It's a love that goes beyond. It's extraordinary lengths that God himself would come to earth. We've celebrated communion, but that communion is because of the love of God for us. Romans 5, and I'm just going to read this to you. I'm kind of, I've got a big book and I don't think I've done very well, so I need to do this. Ta-da! Right, Romans Five. Let me read this to you because it's just wonderful. It's entitled Peace and Hope, but from verse 5, this is what it says. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out, not sprinkled, poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit 
who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, we, read, we sing a song at the moment, he's always on time. Just the right time. When we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person some may possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love is a God that is demonstrated to us. Even when we didn't know him, even when we were far off from him, unworthy, didn't measure up. God's love reached out to us. Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, but because of the great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Jeremiah 31, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Lamentations 3, I love this, verse 22. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, but for his compassion never fails. It is new every morning. Do you know what? The love of God is so important for us to have grounded deep within our hearts. The love of God and God cannot be separated from true love. He created it. He's driven by it. He demonstrated it. He proved it. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of love. He remains the same. He is steadfast and faithful. If we want to share anything about kind of Christianity, we have to start with people to say, God loves you. And yet we have this moment, we have this battle that straight away then, just like Malachi it says, but how does he love me? The connection between what the Bible says and our hearts can be really challenging at times. You know, I believe that if we look at our society, love can be very twisted Love can be very strange. Love can, can be a message of it's okay if you feel it. Love is blind, married at first sight, love island. Are they really stories of love? I don't know. Um, but they are all ways that people are desperately trying to find out the mystery of love, capturing it, desperately wanting to feel love from humans. But how great to feel the love of God. So why is there the disconnection? Well, I've got a few things that I wrote down and there's loads more. But I think the first, and this was probably true for the community around Malachi, Malachi was this, that the love of God is not based on circumstances. You see, the people at the time were going through hardship. They had a dark time. Things weren't going well. There was no fruit. There was nothing. Their prayers were not being answered. It was incredibly full of poverty and affliction and darkness. And we can say, where is God? If God loves me, then what's happening? But let me encourage you, God's love is not based on a moment. It's based on a lifetime. You see, you may go through a season of darkness, but God remains the same. He loves us. And he wants, his love is not based on just blessing. It's based on a seasonal understanding that he loves you wherever we're at. Sometimes the things that we go through, we will not be able to see until we enter heaven. Andy and I have just celebrated our 20 year anniversary. I know, it's a miracle. Um, especially because James and Kirsten did our marriage prep. <laughs> no, they were amazing. But when we did this, you know, we decided we would celebrate, we would go to a place where we got um, engaged. So we went back to Salcombe. That's where we got engaged. It's a place in Devon. And I remember when we got engaged, he took me to the cliff edge and I thought he's either pushing me off or something's happening. <laughs> 
And um, he got down, I didn't know, got down on one knee, got out the bling, and I thought, wow, wow. And then we looked out to sea, and I said, I would. And then we went to a restaurant. This is a symbol of Andy. You know, I went to a restaurant, and then Andy went, we're just going to keep this on the low rate. We've just come to Salcombe. Let's just have a lovely meal. I went, yeah. He went to the loo, yeah. When he went to the loo, I stood up in the restaurant, I've got engaged! By the time he got back in, everyone's clapping. I've got free drinks on the go. <laughs> and he just must have thought, what have I done? But when we went back to Salcombe 20 years later, we said, we took the kids. We're like, let's see where mum and dad got engaged. Went to the cliff. It's crumbled away, guys. <laughs> so we were like, it's not a symbol of our love. <laughs> You see, circumstances can feel like things around us are crumbling. But you see, God's consistency with us doesn't crumble. He never changes. He loves us through every period of our lives. Can I encourage you? I appreciate that you may find it hard because of your circumstances to feel whether God loves you. But I'm telling you now, the dark times will end. There is after sorrow comes joy. God loves you and he will love you in every season of our lives. He is faithful and his love is faithful. You know, I thought Pastor John, what he said earlier was so right that we can base the circumstances on whether we are achieving. Well, God loves me if I've done well. We're about to enter exam time in our house. Oh, glory. Glory. And uh, we've got one who's going to be doing GCSEs and one who's going to be doing her end of kind of art course. It's going to be really calm and peaceful in our house. And obviously you want to add a bit of pressure, especially to my son who's very laid back, you know, just like, hey, it'll happen. No, it's not. You work. <laughs> and, and that's how you feel. Yeah. So I've got like a whiteboard, yeah? And I'm like trying to create a timetable, yeah? And he's, he's, I mean, is it cool? I don't know, probably cool. He buys vinyls. Is that cool, Pastor Paul? It was in your day, wasn't it? <laughs> and vinyl records, he loves them. Not like that, wah, 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 like just like kind of like loves, loves vinyls. He collecting them all, yeah? So I, I said to him, after every time you do revision, I'll buy you a vinyl. They're not cheap, guys. Yeah, you can't get them on the cheap. So, you know, I feel like it's quite a reward system. And he's like, okay, okay. So there you go. You revise that, you get that. And we can feel that about God, that God only loves us when we do that. He only loves us if we've completed everything on the whiteboard. But that's not how God is. His love is not based on circumstances of our kind of, our kind of um, attitude or whether we've done well or whether we've done well in that job interview or that grade or it's not based on that. God loves us in every season. The second thing about God's love is why we might not be able to connect is God's love's not based on feelings. Now, sometimes, you know, we can, our feelings are very fickle, aren't they? Hormones, you know, we can feel something and then we get the ick. Yeah, it's right, isn't it? We get the ick. This is what it's called now. You get the ick. So I've been asking people around me, because I, I don't know why, but I still work with young people. I know, guys, who knows? And I'll say to them, what, what gives you the ick? Yeah, what gives you the ick? Crazy stuff, guys. A girl told me the other day that she got the ick because a guy ordered a cup of tea. How crazy is that, Pastor? She was just like, no, no, no. When he ordered a cup of tea, that was it, right? Ick, ick time, off. I was like, oh, right, okay. Um, it, it's not, God's love isn't based like that. He doesn't all of a sudden get the ick with us and doesn't love us anymore. You see, scripture doesn't change. Our feelings can change. We can feel wonderful in a conference, feel wonderful in God's love, feel him close, feel his embrace. But then we may feel that he's distant. 
Our feelings may feel, we may feel tired, we may feel challenged, but it cannot be based on feelings. It has to be based on the Word of God. God's love is for us. And I think that the people who Malachi was speaking to maybe were having these feelings and they questioned it. The love of God can be blocked by our wrong living. How many of us know that? That actually, even in this book of Malachi, it goes on through the chapters to explain what the people needed to do. There was things in their lifestyle that weren't measuring up. And, you know, God, through Malachi, God was saying, you need to adjust these guys. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love us, but it means our connection with him can be a barrier. We know that even when we were dead in our transgressions, we read that earlier, his love is not far away from us, but we can feel that block. I love the fact that you guys have that moment to do communion with God. Do you know, um, I, I don't know if it was Pastor Paul, let's say it is, let's quote him. Yeah, let's quote him. He used to say, keep a, keep a short sheet with God. You know, like don't leave it weeks and weeks before you come back to God and repent. You know, and, and those moments of communion are opportunities for us to say, sorry, God, I'm coming back. Thank you. If there's anything in my life, any bitterness, any resentment, any jealousy, any comparison, God, I, I kind of lift it off and I come to you again. And God is faithful and just and forgive us. And my mum and dad, Peter and Meg Worthington, are amazing prayers. And my mum has a mantelpiece, yeah, in her house. And at the centre of the mantelpiece, she has a powerful poem, Footprints. Do you know this powerful poem? Some people believe it's in the Bible. It's not, yeah? Right, Footprints, yeah? She'd have it on tea towels, T-shirts, badges. You know, there it was. And in the middle of the mantelpiece, Footprints. And it's a powerful bit at the end. It's then when I carried you, you know, oh, wow. Anyway, in the middle. Now, times of my life when I, got gradu when I graduated and I got married, there'd be a, a, an amazing photo that would come out, you know, me and Andy posing, you know, at the Chateau Ibn. It's now turned into a painting ball range. But anyway, you know, posing um, or something else, yeah. And, and we'd have this photo and I'd come into mum and dad's house and the footprints would have been moved and in the centre of the mantelpiece would be a picture of us. So this was an opportunity for me to mock my mum and dad and go, oh, hang on. Oh, what's happening here? There's been a shift. Footprints has moved to the side. And all of a sudden, what's happening now? And my mum would get very, very worried about this. And she'd laugh, but straight away, you'd see her shifting, <laughs> shifting it back. And I love that because that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to realign and shift back. So often things can just crowd in. And they're, they're lovely things sometimes, but they crowd in. And we just have to shift stuff back. Shift our thinking back. Shift our lifestyle back so that God is the centre. Another thing that maybe was why the, the people were struggling with connecting with God was because they'd lost the church and the temple was desolated. So they were no longer gathering together. I don't know how you felt in COVID, but I felt like my right arm and left leg was sawn off. I mean, I have been to church since I was conceived. Not in church, wasn't conceived, but see, <laughs> you know, I literally, prayer meeting after prayer meeting, I would be in church Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And when all of a sudden you couldn't go, I didn't know what to do, guys. I mean, I was absolutely lost. I mean, I was like, well, what do we do on a Sunday? I'd be watching other people, you know, cleaning their cars, thinking, oh my goodness, Lord, what's happening to us? You know, it was such an awful time. And many of us were struggling. That's how this generation would have felt. They had nowhere to come to and gather. Can I encourage you that, yes, of course, your relationship is amazing with God on your own. It is an individual relationship, but there is nothing like gathering in the house of God. Better is one day in his courts than a thousand elsewhere. Don't do once a month. 
drop in. We're not a club. Yeah? Yeah? It's an every week thing. Yeah? Because it kindles us. It gives us that energy of God's love. We're reminded through the worship, through the communion, through other people that we are loved and he loves us. There is nothing like the house of God. Andy and I led a church for over 10 years and we've now kind of handed that in and we're now going to Champions Church and my son is playing lead guitar in the band. He's He's amazing, yeah? Well, It's been incredible for him because he's kind of got a new passion for the house. It's been wonderful to see. And he went to um, a kind of youth weekend and he decided he would take his friend. Right, so I'm like, okay, have you talked to your friend? Does he know what he's expecting? He's like, leave it, mom. Yeah, so it's like, okay, right. So off he goes, his friend Jordan's come to church with him. And on the weekend, he made a decision to follow Jesus. Incredible. And so that's why Andy is not here today, because Ellie's had to go early to play in the band. So Andy's bringing Jordan to church for the first time today. And I just think, wow, he's never been to church. We can take it for granted. And he just could not believe all these people were going, hi, wow, nice to meet you. And he joked in the car on the way back. And I said to him, how did you feel about it? And he was like, because he's quite a tall lad, yeah. And he said, Rach, I did feel a little bit weird when I went out the front and I was standing up. And, you know, I'm tall and I'm ginger. And I said, do you know what? God even loves gingers. <laughs> It was amazing to see his like eyes come alive when he discovered not just God's love, but the house of God and all these people who loved him. God is so faithful. And I want to encourage you, one born, connect with God and his love. You know, if you want to share with anyone else, if you serve in the church, if you've got people who don't know Jesus, then you need to be saturated in the knowledge that God loves you. And it will just seep out. When you are in love with God and you realise his love, it's contagious. And people are, are just drawn to it. People want to experience the love of God. We have this incredible story of Peter in the Bible. And there he was, Peter the disciple. And he followed Jesus. He saw all these incredible miracles around Jesus. And yet, right when Jesus needed him, he let Jesus down. And he denied that he knew his best friend. But then we have the comeback story where Peter is just on the beach, he's returned, he's tried to fled away, he's done a Jonah, he, he, he feels lost, he doesn't feel connected to God's love. And then we have this amazing moment where Jesus comes, cooks breakfast on the beach, how incredible is that? And then speaks personally to Peter. And what he says to Peter is amazing, because what he does is he asks him this, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And he asks him it three times because he's reinstating in Peter's heart, yes, I love you, God. And I feel sometimes in my life, I need to reinstate that value again. Rachel, do you love me? And I reply, yes, God, I love you. Can I encourage you today as we pray? And the band is just going to play a song. I want to encourage any of you who don't know Jesus. I want to encourage you this morning, just through everything that you've seen today, God loves you. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter your history. It doesn't matter your credentials. God loves you. As high as the galaxies are above the earth, he loves you. He loves you endlessly. He knew you you before you were born. He knows the end of your life. He absolutely loves you. And I want to pray for you. 
that you would experience the love of God. But I also want to pray for all of us that however long we've been in church, however many years we made that wonderful decision that I will follow Jesus, I believe we need those moments where God comes again and just fills us with his love. Fills us with an expression of his love that he loves you. You're, until you get to heaven and you experience the true love of God, we only have fragments of it, don't we? But how wonderful to have those fragments on earth. And that's what I want to pray. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for your demonstrated love through history to us. God, I'm sorry when we've turned away, when we've not accepted your love. I come today and I say I'm sorry. And I want to be a Christian. I want to come to you. I want to begin to experience your love and forgiveness and be part of your family, the church. Amen. If that's you, then just as we're kind of gathering round and saying goodbye, will you speak to Pastor Deb or one of the other people that you know in the church or the friend that you've come with and let them know that you've made that decision. They'll be able to give you information. But just for all of us right now, as the band plays, I just want to encourage you to make a visual sign that you want to be filled with God's love. It might be that you want to stand up in the song. It might be that you just want to lift up your hands. It might be that you want to kneel. It might be that you just kind of want to hold the person's hand next to you and just pray for each other. Whatever it is, I just want to encourage you in this song because the love of God is here and he wants to fill you with his love and passion in your life. Father God, as we worship you in this song, we pray that you would fill us with your love. We may have gone through a dark time. We may struggle and feel that you are far away. But God, you are reminding us today that you are near us and that you love us. You love us in every season. You love us, our background and our creed. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we say thanks to Rach for that amazing message? Absolutely brilliant.